Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, just a, one correction. Unfortunately, the AMS conference system online doesn't really allow you to go back in and change your profile. So we are actually now NOAA Earth Systems Research Laboratory, um, and we're in, uh, I am in uh, Global Systems Division, which used to be FSL. Same thing, but now it's called Global Systems Division. So now we're GSD. I'm also affiliated with uh, CSU CIRA in Fort Collins. One of the reasons that we began developing thin clients uh, within our laboratory was because of our previous development in very large systems. Some of the development that happened within GSD when it was FSL was the development of the AWIC system. And the AWIC system is the operational system that's used by the National Weather Service forecasters in all of their WFOs and the river forecast centers in those places. Now, the advent of the Internet and the advent of forecasters and researchers um, moving into the field for operational events such as fires and flood, flood events and so forth, as well as uh, researchers who wanted to go in the field and, for example, forecast for the positioning of assets in a field campaign like ships and airplanes and so forth required that users be able to get to the rich data set that was available on an AWIP type system. Now that data repository is a combination of ob observing systems, um, including radar, surface ob, satellite, etc., as well as all the forecast models that are out there. Now forecast models come over um, the NOAA port or the AWIP system as a part of the of NCEP, and our National Center for Environmental Prediction, um, work on sending out, of course, operational um, modeling. And you all use a great number of those products. Um, I've seen uh, yesterday I saw a number of models that were used up there, including global models like TFS and NOGAP, uh, the ECMWF, for example. Um, obviously, this is something that you need to use in the field, of course, in your offices as well, to keep track of what's going on um, in your areas of, of uh, interest. But one of the things that was not available to users when they were in the field, the field campaigns, or for uh, fire weather forecasters when they went out to a fire, was a way to get to that rich data set um, over a low bandwidth type of line. So what we did, and our, our focus was to get a, that rich data repository out to the forecaster and researcher in the field, so extending the reach of those folks in the field, but also allowing them to get to all that rich data over a low bandwidth with multiple, the multiple data sets were available, including research data sets. We add in experimental models, for example, and um, non-operational observing systems. Um, we add in a number of things that aren't coming over the standard line so that field researchers have the opportunity to get a hold of their model, for example, so they can do verification in the field. Um, and we replicate all the operational tools and displays that uh, the folks that wanted to be out in the field, like sorry, where the forecasters were allowed to get. So the AFXNet system is basically what we consider somewhat of a tactical system. Uh, the most users right now are users that are out in the field doing their quality forecasting. The National Weather Service incident meteorologists are in the field with their, um, you can see their little BGAN system. It's a satellite comm system. Uh, you can use any kind of communication system in the field with this um, laptop and this Java client um, that I have on my laptop, and I'll show you an example of that later. But the D2D means uh, that's a display two-dimensional interface. That's basically the same thing that they have in their national and sort of forecast offices, so they don't have to learn a new uh, interface. Obviously, we wanted to make sure that it was a little bit easier for researchers who have not used AWS to use, and so... Um, the interface also has online help files, and also we're available to do um, different um, training if it's, if it's needed. Uh, the client runs on very modest hardware. You can have a laptop with just one gigabyte of RAM and a 1.7 um, gigahertz machine, and it will work on a Mac. It will also work on a Linux box because it is a Java client. 
So since for the FXNet system that I'm going to demonstrate to you is tailored um, for images overlaying on weather zones and map backgrounds, we tend to tailor these systems uh, specifically for, for uh, our users. For example, IMAP have servers in all of their regional headquarters offices, National Weather Service regional headquarters offices, and we tailor their, their scale specifically to them. Sometimes we add in data that's just local to their offices. Most of the time we try to bring all that in so everybody has that data available to them. Um, the geospatial information um, available on, on the FXNet system is something that doesn't come from one of any of the other um, internet windows that you could get. You have a, a number of websites that you use for, and I've seen a number of forecasters do that in the field. I've seen them with 10 windows open to get to all the different pieces of information that are available. What we try to do is put all those pieces of information in one application or one window, if you will, and with overlay capabilities, and the, the information is also time matched and spatially matched. So what you're looking at has some relation uh, to all the different layers that are in the system. Uh, we can display the radar imagery. All the radars uh, across the U.S. are available independently. There's also a regional radar application um, that's available on, on some of the newer versions of the system. Um, one of the things that the forecasters in the field for example, um, severe weather uh, forecasters, when they're going through a potential flooding event, uh, need to have the information that comes from the river forecast centers as well, and we have some of that information in there. Um, the GIS systems that are in this system up to this point are um, are not as good as we would like them to be. They're not as good as some of the uh, websites that you all go to, so we're, we're trying to improve that. We're working very hard to improve the GIS in this system. Um, also, um, the D2D interface, I keep saying that because that's what the interface for the AWS system is called, and the display two dimensions is somewhat misleading because you have multidimensional data. Uh, you have all the volume versions of the, of the model, for example. You have surface odds, of course, in the radar and the satellite, et cetera, and you can uh, selectively combine those in a variety of different ways that I'll show you. So this is the infrastructure for the platform. Um, Pretty minimum, pretty standard uh, computer that you can get these days. And uh, once again, it does run on a Mac. If you're a Mac file, which uh, a lot of forecasters are, that you know a lot of uh, capabilities in terms of uh, security on Mac that others don't have. Um, and the bandwidth, we we recommend at least 56 kbps or higher. We have forecasters who run it on 28k. And they know how to do that. They know not to bring out the highest possible resolution data. They, they reduce the density of the product, which is selectable on the system. So reduce the density just with the odds that you want to if you have a really low bandwidth line. Um, so but we recommend at least 56 kilobits. Uh, this is the server farm. This is just an example of what um, the server system looks like in the various areas. There's servers in regional headquarters, I said, for the National Weather Service. There's also sets of servers in Boulder in our shop. Um, and we support users from all over the country um, on our set of servers in uh, Boulder. And we're supporting folks from um, air quality community, uh, USDA, and the Forest Service, and BLM are the fire weather forecasters. They're the prediction services folks. Uh, when you go into a national forest or state forest and you see that Smokey the Bear indicator that says that the fire danger is low to high, uh, those are the folks that make that decision as to where that uh, dial gets set as far as fire danger goes. Um, and they use our system to make that determination for their forecast. Uh, we also work uh, with the um, DOD, the Air Force One weather forecasters uh, back east use the system uh, to forecast the weather for um, flight paths for Air Force One. And uh, air quality researchers, the University of New Hampshire and some state universities have been using it for quite a few years, both as an educational tool and as a field system for their field campaigns. Um, one of the reasons, one of the ways we found out how well the system really works in terms of supporting a lot of users on a single set of servers is that they had a classroom full of about 50 students, all with access to a computer. They all pulled up the same field and the same set of products at the same time, so 50 users coming at the system at the same time with request and there was no delay for any of them to get the data. So it does hold it does serve a lot of people on a single set of servers. 
Um, some of the things that we do, this is, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because I did get the system um, up and running here. I wasn't sure that there would be an internet connection in the room so that I could give you a live demo. Um, so I just took a bunch of screenshots. So I'll show you a few of the things that um, the system does, uh, that, and then I'll show you some other stuff um, on the system in real time. Uh, you, can, you have the opportunity to do a variety of different data analyses, um, including matching images. In this image, you're seeing a combination of a background field, which is basically a visible satellite image. Um, and the image on the front, you can see at the bottom there, is a snow cover image. This is a snow cover product that's developed by um, NCEP. NCEP derives this from some of their observing systems and also some analyses from uh, initialization of some of the model fields. So this is a snow cover image over the state of Colorado. Then I'm focused on some of Wyoming as well. The other thing that's up there is you have an ability to change your color map. If you have a favorite uh, color map or if you really need to have an understanding of a thresholding on certain parameters within a gridded field, this is a gridded field image, uh, you have the ability to change the color map so your field or your, how you want to threshold your data is obvious within the image once you bring the image back up. And then the image on image can also be used for combining things like radar and satellite data. There's a variety of different combinations you can use. And then you can adjust the brightness of each one if you want to see one brighter than the other, for, for example. Um, of course, overlay capability, um, more than just image on image, you also have the ability to look at each pixel on that image. You can inter interrogate the exact number on both of the images that are loaded, and or one image, however you want to do it. Um, also, the ability to mark a place in your field of interest, whether it be what you can call it anything you want to, you can do it by lab long, or you can do it by hand. And once you do the um, the marker, there's a drawing tool there. That's a shape file. There's a marker there that you can see towards the bottom. You can see where it says um, Denver, and that persists throughout all of your maps until you decide to take it off or hide it or change it or move it. So you can have a point of interest or a number of them. You can put as many on that map as you want to. You can draw anything you want to and put, leave it on there. Um, the other op opportunity you have, and this is for folks um, sometimes who have to go brief um, other folks in the field. Um, the, the weather, the fire weather forecasters, when they go to fires, have to brief the incident commanders. And they need to brief the incident commanders on what's happening in the next six hours, and they have another briefing, they have a briefing every six hours. So they need to have an understanding um, for the incident commanders where the winds are going to show up or where they think the humidity is going to go up, where they think it's going to rain, so they can draw their charts to allow them to sort of target certain areas um, and then overlay it on their incident command map. The other opportunity that uh, we've given the, the forecasters is to allow them to bring in a, a variety of different shape files. And shape files are just a term for some of the maps that you see on your website that give you areas uh, that are filled in. For example, these are fire perimeters. Uh, these are fires um, that were that burned in Oregon in 2007. And these are the perimeters of the fire. We just happened to pull in a uh, radar image at the same time, which really doesn't have that much to do with the shape files, but you most likely in the weather modification community, you have target areas where you would like to target a certain um, seeding incident and you want to look for the clouds in that particular area. If you have the ability to bring in a file that says, here's my target area, or you have a, a number of areas, you can pull those in and allow those to be overlaid on your map along with the real-time weather data. Uh, the other information that you get from those state files, if, if there's a lot of information associated with that state file, as there is with these uh, smoke products, the Oregon fire products, it tells you the name of the fire, it tells you the perimeter, it gives you a bunch of other information about its location. Um, the same would be true for any other state files you brought in. It doesn't make any difference really where they come from. Um, all state files have an associated uh, list of information. Uh, this is an example of one of the fire weather forecasters uh, um, and uh, image file. This is a gridded image. It comes from a, uh, it comes from, I think this is a GFS model. It doesn't say that on the bottom, but I think that's what this is. So they've adjusted their image contour 
that are in this table uh, to allow them to look at the grid field and contour in a sort of geographic map where they have a threshold determined by the, the color table that they've developed. A lot of them points allow you to get to uh, the full volume of model data in cross sections. You can do soundings at points. Um, it basically allows you to slice and dice through any of the very large sets of model data that you have available. And I've just picked one. This is basically, if you see the line in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little, it's hard to see on the screen, there's a little map in the background there that shows you this is going from Durango. Um, um, up north in the mountains, so we're going in a uh, northeast direction. And the slice of information there comes from the non-12 model, and it gives you the uh, terrain height at the bottom of the field, and then I've overlaid, I've imaged the relative humidity field, of course overlaid that then with the wind field. So that gives you a cross-section of what's going on within a non-12 model. Now that's animatable, you can animate that out as far as the non-model goes out. All of these, uh, data sets when their time maps animate out to their associated time sequences. For example, if you have a satellite image and you overlay a model image, you're only going to have the model and the satellite associated with each other, of course, when they overlap time-wise. So the timing is, is set up for you and automatically matched. Also, you have all the tech products that are available from the National Weather Service as well. And you have the ability to notify so, uh, yourself or the products that you'd like to see come in. For example, if you're in a convective situation, you may have a text product that comes from your local WFO that you'd like to be aware of. When it shows up, you don't have to go in and look for it. So you can set that up ahead of time, and it'll, it'll alert you and tell you when that, when or if that severe weather uh, text product came in. Um, you can also print off the text products as well. Now, the experimental models and field data that I mentioned, um, here's a couple of examples of it. We're going to have a talk, I believe, tomorrow by Steve Peckham, Dr. Steve Peckham from our laboratory. And he's developing the Wolf chem model. This is an inline chemistry model that does um, a variety of different types of, of chemical atmospheric species, ozone, um, particulate matter, PM10, PM2.5, et cetera. And uh, that model is on the upper left-hand side, um, and that's an ozone field. Uh, so that's an experimental model, but we put it on the system because we have air quality forecasters that are interested in a lot, you know, forecasting um, the, the uh, ozone and particulate matter during various seasons of the year. And it's not available over any other operational settings, so they, they didn't get to, to the system. And then on the lower right-hand side is a experimental model that's being developed within ESRL. It's called the SCAN. It's the first following ICOS achievable model. This is a global model. I've only showed you the Northern Hemisphere version of it, but it is a global model. It's a 15-kilometer global model. Um, a lot of folks are interested in looking at this. There's a lot of verification um, opportunities out there. If you'd like to look at this experimental model in the field, you can look at the model and, of course, the conversation with the observations to the model, which is what our researchers in the laboratory are doing. They're using our system to look at this model on a daily basis so they can compare it with other models and also with the observing system. So it's a good research tool as well. <clears throat> so this is a snow water equivalent image um, over Colorado. This is, once again, this is an NSAP product. Um, I believe NSAP creates this product from most of the um, most of the areas within the U.S. This just happens to be a Rocky Mountain region area. There's a northern Rocky Mountain product, so there's products all, all over, especially in the areas where there's snow. Um, this is a current product. I just put this together yesterday, so um, you can read the information on the color bar there. Um, this, this will be in my slides, so you guys can look at this um, later if you want to look at this image a little bit more. It's a somewhat coarse image. Um, I don't know what the exact um, uh, resolution of it is, but it's, it's a, it's a good, um, understanding of the snow water that's on the mountains right now. This is an example of, if I could find those shape files, I would have, I would have ingested them in the system. I don't know really where these are, but this is one of the things that I've seen over, um, Colorado River Basin area that could be a shape file that you could pull into your system if you were using it in that area. 
And there's a way to mod sites and target areas uh, map that I also found. Once again, this is a map that could be pulled in, um, given that you have a target, target areas in your system that you'd like to look at. We have another system, in case anyone is looking for the gridded fields that show up from, um, the, from MSET, which has the same data set as FXNet, but these are actual grids and real imagery. Uh, we use, this system is used by the BLM and the Forest Service um, across the U.S. in their uh, geographical area coordination, coordination centers. They have a number of fire weather um, products and algorithms that they need to use in order to uh, put their products and their predictive services information on the web. So we ship them the grids. We have a central set of servers in Boulder, and we ship them the grids all over the country. So they have all the model fields as well as observing systems, radar, and satellite data. Now they utilize that system to extract the grids locally so that they have the grid and data to run their algorithms with. And one of the enabling technologies of this system and the FXNet system is the way we compress our data. We have a custom compression uh, system, uh, it's called wavelet compression. And this is an enabling technology for us to ship grids around. Um, there's very few other, there aren't any other systems using this particular compression algorithm, um, because it's not a WMO standard, but it's been used in operations for about five years now. Um, we achieve the same error rate on our gridded, in our gridded fields as the, as NSEP does using GRIB2. The, with GRIB2, it's a 4 to 1 compression ratio with the same error and the same field, we get closer to a 20 to 1 compression ratio. So we're actually moving the grids around in a much faster manner using less bandwidth, um, actually using less CPU time than some of the other compression algorithms do. Our CPU time is very low uh, for the encoder and decoder. So some of the things we're going to do with the FXNet systems, we, we have uh, worked with a few of the Colorado folks um, in the weather modification program. Joe Busso gotten us connected with the folks here, which has been very interesting for us, and we're, we're anxious to work with them a little bit more on understanding the confidence that go into the weather modification community and what you're looking for. Um, we can intend to track the needs there, but also how do we use some of the emerging technologies that are out there? Some of the things that we're trying to do are somewhat tactical in nature because of our fire weather connections. We want to be able to send alarms and alerts and products to smartphones and TDAs, for example. But also how do we integrate uh, some of the new high-res uh, some of the observations, observing systems that are going to be in the field. Um, the fire weather initiative that I'm involved with with NOAA and NIST um, is going to allow us to use maybe unmanned aerial system sites over fires. Um, it could be something that's being used for uh, debris, debris flow evaluation as well. So there's a variety of different things that we want to, to do in terms of emerging um, observing systems and computing systems. Um, and of course, how do, you, how do you guys want to see it? How do you want to see the the data. I've gotten some feedback from folks, and we're going to work on trying to get some well, some of these displays and analysis tools tailored to what you guys are looking for. And with that, I'm going to uh, give you a, a live demonstration. We hooked this up earlier. Hopefully, this still works. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I've uh, loaded um, some observing systems. It's basically the METAR plot of, uh, over Colorado. Um, other observing systems you can load. There's a, there's a list of those. So I'll just go through those real briefly. Uh, the, the METAR plot that I loaded is basically a background METAR. There's not much else in there but METAR. If you'd like to see a variety of other plots, you can load. Uh, a variety of different time steps. You can load just pre-step, pre feeling visibility, etc. The 30-minute station plot is the plot that's going to give you uh, data that's so dense when you zoom out, you're not going to be able to see the state. Let me zoom out here on a, this is max density for just the METAR plot over the U.S. If I would load the entire plot, all the plots for all the station plots, um, it would be, um, all of the gray would be obliterated. So 
I just decided to load this in these hearts. So you can get a granularity of observing systems in a very small area that's probably more than you can see in just about any other web, website. So uh, that's one of the one of the benefits of the system. We pull in this data in a system in the laboratory called Native. The Native system brings in observing, observations from mesonets that are not um, coming over the no port or any other link. It also brings in lo other local data. It brings in the citizens' weather, uh, the CWAP data. So there's, there's information, all the information in there is a collection of data from all over, and we get DO, some of the DOD jobs that aren't classified, et cetera. So there's just there's a lot of, it's a rich data set that's not available anyplace else. We also have the ability to uh, pull up just about any model that's available out there. I have a, a set of data from the NOM 12 run this morning, and this is the um, wind field as well as uh, 850, what's the 850 millibar wind height and R8. The background is R8, that's image. I can zoom in a little bit, a little more here. And you see Durango sitting there. I put that marker in there this morning uh, using this tool, and I mentioned markers before. Uh, you can call you can call it anything you want, and change the color, make the color anything that you want, and so that's the color you want. And then you can use the cursor to place the marker any place you want on the screen. Or you can, if you know the exact location of a instrument or a target area, you can type in the lat long, and that marker will be placed exactly in the precise location that you'd like to see it pop down. This is the volume browser. This is how we get to all of our model data. Um, as you see in here, we have, uh, this is another air quality model, the CMAC model. That's the National Weather Service's air quality model. We have ECMWF, there's SCAM, it's another experimental model. The FCAM is a fire weather model. This is the one that's running up at Fort Collins um, in the Forest Service up there. Um, and we have all the NCAT models. We have ensemble models as well. We have guidance models. Um, the GFS models, long range model is there. That's not something that comes over the NCAT field data. That's the one that goes out to 384 hours. Um, that's used by the citizen services folks in uh, the BLM. And of course, then we have a variety of other things that are running. We have some other uh, experimental models that are running at the laboratory. Um, here's the Walsh Chem model. Um, so the variety of um, also parameters that come from these models, including the, the air quality data. And the air quality data gives you a variety of different things if anyone's interested in air quality data. Uh, in maps, you have the ability to do a lot of different overlays and help files. It gives you help, tells you how to use everything in here. Uh, you have a 10 kilometer national radar product. You also have the regional product. And of course, then you have the radar chooser, which is right here which allows you to bring up any, any ra and choose any radar from across the nation. You can um, pick any of those, and it'll bring up a high-resolution um, county-level map. Uh, and then you can load whatever radar product you'd like to see in there. Composite, I believe I'm in Iowa. Yes. Um, the other options, you can change the looping properties. Here's where you find your drawing tool. Your preferences allows you to set how many um, how many frames you'd like to animate. You can animate like 45 frames if you want to look at the full GFS, for example. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of a lot of techniques. There's, there's a lot of information. It's a very rich um, uh, client. It allows you to get the data in all sorts of different ways. And there's the radar if you come from Iowa. So are there any questions? Um, what we, the product or the client is available to um, a variety of different folks right now for um, use in Weather mod, uh, we've got a, some folks from Colorado, so if you ask the Colorado guys that are paying for it, <laughs> I'm happy to give you the URL. <laughs> so, so how do you think it's, you got to use custom or what? Can you make 
Well, we have uh, a variety of different, we have, for example, our, we, we can't have everybody on our service because we would have the entire nation on our service, unfortunately. Um, if, if you're associated with a program, for example, if you're associated with a university and you're doing fire weather research and, you know, the weather service says, sure, you know, let them work on this, um, you know, you'll get a client. It's just a, like, like you said, it's a URL, you download it, and there's an executable that downloads on your system and, and installs. Um, the Java client for you. So the way that we've been working it is if we have a customer who's paying for it, we allow the customer to determine who gets access to the client. Um, that way we, we know where the clients are and we know who's using them. Um, we, have to, we have to have some sort of bound, boundaries on it somewhere along the line, otherwise we wouldn't, you know, we'd, we'd end up with 2,000 people on one set of clients or one set of servers. If you have the client and you have, and I'll, I'll let you know how you set it up, it's a non-standard port access, it's, you know, I'll let, tell you how you get access to it, um, but if you can... Um, you to set up your own servers, you, you need to get all of the data sets, you need to set up a NOAA port link. If you have no port, and if you want localized data, we use, we use LVM to bring that localized data in. Uh, we can help you figure out how to set it up. Pardon? You, yeah, you just uh, you need a client. You need to at least build you a client. If you had a, if you already had all the data sets, we could talk to you about building a client for it. It's pretty standard. I mean, it's not. That's, that's pretty simple to do, to build a new client. You just you just change the address to a new set of servers. That's all you do. Pardon? Um, we've, uh, there's, we've done that to, with uh, some folks. We've uh, sort of done an agreement with them to try to set up that system on their clients. We do have to charge something for our labor and our time. But yeah, it is available. Um, the difference is that we've we've uh, we've designed this to be a more real time system. Uh, the access time to data is faster. Uh, the system that Unidata has that, and, and we've uh, looked at that system. We've, we've worked with those folks with that. We're actually talking to them right now about using our, our compression technology on that system. Um, that system's really a, a system that allows you to go out and discover data that are on all sorts of different servers in a variety of different places and bring in an entire data set at one time. Um, it's just a little, it's, it's a little too slow for operations and for a tactical system. Um, and the slice and dice capabilities in the system is a little bit more operationally um, approachable as well. So uh, we do have a lot of universities that use it, however, because they want to do, when they do Teach a class. They would like. They need to get to the data a little bit faster and a little more. Oh, it's global. We have FIM on there. It's global. <laughs> we also use it. The the Australian the Australian fire fire fighters have been interested in using it. So we've moved some. No. You need a 56 kilobit link or a little higher, hopefully a little higher. It works on 56 kilobit. This, this is my one, my Colorado user who's giving me all the really good feedback. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.